Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Field Tech podcast. My name is Alan. And I'm Chris. I was going to say that guy over there is Chris, but okay. That guy's Chris. Um, and hey, welcome back to another episode on a Theotech podcast. Uh, how are you doing, Chris? Pretty good. Cool. Awesome. I'm doing pretty well, too. Um, last week, we talked about Venture Calvinist. This week, we're going to continue that conversation. Uh, but before we do that, Chris, um, do you want to tell people about your blog? Sure. Uh, my blog is meritandgrace.com, M-E-R-I-T-A-N-D-G-R-A-C-E.com. Uh, and that's where I chronicled some of my journey in leaving Amazon, starting Theotech, the struggles, and the kind of mindset, um, the God-centered mindset that I'm pursuing and trying to make the kind of the principle for the company, uh, as well as other kinds of stories along the way. One of the things that I wanted to do was to write these blog posts in the middle of the journey so that whatever happens, you know, rather than having a nice, nice polished story at the end, I can remember what I was actually feeling, experiencing, and struggling with in the beginning of the journey when everything feels hopeless. Uh, and so <laughs> that's what I wanted to do in chronicling this and, and be able to see really God's grace and faithfulness throughout that whole story. Yeah. So if you want to read more of those raw things along the way, you can find them at meritandgrace.com. Um, I have all kinds of content on there, unfortunately, so it's not exclusive to this, but hopefully the other co- other things I post about, you'll also find engaging. Yeah, for sure. And you can also find Chris at Merit and Grace, doc, or Merit and Grace Twitter. on Twitter. Yeah, that's at my Twitter Merit handle. And yeah. Merit and, um, and, and I mean, the reason why I brought this up was because you actually wrote a four-part series on Venture Calvinist, uh, which is great material, and I re- read it and reread it. So um, for those of you listening, you can also uh, follow along um on his blog and just kind of read up uh you'll also find like the definition that chris wrote down as well as some of the, the some of the things that we are going to be talking about today so uh let's dive right into this so again um this is continuation of last week and um i'm just going to reread the definition of venture calvinist so the first definition is someone compelled by the love of god to embark on risky adventures for the sake of the gospel, because he or she loves others and trusts in God's sovereign grace. Again, someone compelled by the love of God to embark on risky adventures for the sake of the gospel, because he or she loves others and trusts in God's sovereign grace. So the second definition, and this is the definition that we're going to be spending some time uh, talking about, is a speculator who makes themselves and all they possess available for innovative projects that magnify the supreme worth of Christ and bless the world at large because they trust in God's sovereign grace. Again, a speculator who makes themselves and all they possess available for innovative projects that magnify the supreme worth of Christ and bless the word the world at large because they trust in God's sovereign grace. Did I nail that? I nailed you that. did. I nailed that. It's also a silly pun on venture capitalists, but I hope that you guys caught that <laughs> as well. I hope so. Um, and maybe people don't know what venture capitalism is. Sure. I actually took these definitions, some of them from Google, and adapted them for venture Calvinist. But uh, venture capital firms raise you know, huge funds of hundreds of millions of dollars from places like pensions and things like that, that they then uh, manage and invest in high-risk, high-reward ventures. So mm-hmm. companies like Google... Facebook, they their growth was significantly accelerated because they were able to raise millions and millions of dollars from venture capital firms that brought in the, the money so they could hire and grow their team and develop their product and reach the market, capture the market, mm-hmm. as well as their networks and relationships um, and that, that strong institutional backing mm-hmm. that lets you take the idea and grow it really fast. Yeah. And that's what venture capital firms do. And they're looking for a, a really big exit where they maybe put in you know, let's just make up a number. They put in like $10 million, they can get $100 million out. Mm-hmm. That's what they want. So obviously, again, this is wordplay on venture capitalists. Yep. And it's a good reason why you picked it too, because, you know, venture capitalists, you've got this really rich, wealthy, or a group of rich, wealthy people who have a lot of money, have a lot of power, and they come in and say, okay, we want to invest in your team, dump the money, and we expect, you know, this return, mm. you know, 10 years down the line, right? Mm. So now you're taking this idea and kind of like applying this to God, right? So obviously God, we're assuming he's 
the guy who has everything. Mm -hmm. And because he has everything, we're coming to him and we we're like, hey, we have this idea and we want to invent something. Not only are you the venture capitalist, but you're also going to be our customer later. So we want to be able to take what you give us, but also invest that and produce a product that not only can benefit us in this world, but also be a awesome product for God. Is that kind of where? I think that you have the right flow. Okay. Yeah. I just might use different words, but you had the right flow. Okay, cool. Yeah. God's the investor. He's the provider of everything that we have. And uh, in investing it in us, he expects a good return as an investor. And you're right. Not only does he want a good return, but the thing that we actually create and invent is something that can serve his interests. Yeah. So it's not, you know, when... It, it's like, yeah, you get to invest in the creation of something that also delivers what you want. Not only do you get a return on the on the capital that you put into it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, yeah. And you're not being, uh, this is not nominational or denominational specific. Venture Cal you're just basically using Calvinist as a wordplay, but also you're taking some of the ideology from... Yeah, I think that uh, it's it's a it's a pun, yeah. so it sounds cool. It rolls off the tongue. Venture <laughs> Calvinist. Yeah. I'm a venture Calvinist. But uh, maybe if I were to take one doctrine from Calvin's theology, it would be really um, God's sovereignty, mm -hmm. right? That he truly is in full control of all things down to the smallest detail, to the biggest macroscopic cosmic universal mm -hmm. effects, and that he arranges everything according to his wisdom and providence to fulfill his purpose and plan and his will in the world mm -hmm. and all that he created. And uh, that's huge. Like that, That's already a massive worldview, yeah. right? To be grounded that God truly is sovereign and has the authority over everything yeah and is in full control of all things for sure yeah and i, I think that's that's really good to know but i think what we're going to talk about is does that do you feel like that all the time and, does it translate we, right yeah does it translate like do yeah. we do we feel that he is sovereign all the time and i think that's what we're going to talk about um as obviously many of you know chris has been doing field tech for I want to say coming on two years, two years. I was going to say three years, but I was nope. close. Um, so yeah, so you've been, you've been venturing at, you've been adventuring, <laughs> uh, um, you know, in, yeah. in the form of Theotech. Right. And, yeah. um, I would say just as a, as a bystander, not everything has been tip top shape. Not everything has been according to plan and certainly not every moment feels like God is sovereign. I mean, there's definitely times where you definitely feel like this is amazing this is exciting we're going gung-ho but i don't think that was always the case right no i mean uh the struggles are daily yeah right and i think that in my blog i talk about a period of my life uh where everything feel felt like it just was pretty much hopeless um <laughs> and uh, you know we can talk about that a little bit more but i would say that um it's not always it's not always so much that it feels like god's not sovereign but you might doubt that he's really actually working it for your good. Mm. You might feel like, oh, I went out on a limb. I speculated. I banked on God. Yeah. Right. And I got disappointed. Mm. And not because he's not powerful enough to fix everything and make everything amazing. It's because he didn't want to. Yeah. Ugh. Right. Yeah. So that, that's even worse, though, because it's like he had the ability to, but he didn't want to. Like if, if our God was not om omnipotent, right, uh -huh. it, you could kind of like brush it off and be like, OK, he's not powerful enough to change my and, 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 that, and at that point, you would say, yeah, he's not sovereign then. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, the reason why it didn't work out is because uh, God had a plan, but it didn't work out. Yeah. He failed. Yeah. That's what it would be like to say that he's not sovereign. Yeah. Yeah. But in this in this scenario, it's like he has the ability to, but he's not. Yeah. And so you feel like, you know, you feel like. Well, God, I thought that, you know, I was pursuing, I speculated yeah. that if I put my money, time, effort, skill, energy into this outcome that you want, mm -hmm. that you would then want to invest in it. Yeah. But I guess not. Yeah. Oh, you know, that's, <laughs> that's more of what it felt. That's more of what it could feel like. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's been a big growth thing for me. This whole, this whole time doing Theotech, like I have to admit that more than anything else, I feel like this whole first two years or whatever has been character development. Mm -hmm. More than business development, more than technology, product development has been character development. Because mm -hmm. uh, I've never probably had to trust God for as much as I have in this season. Yeah. And the thing that's been incredible has been that, uh, that makes me joyful, but also it's hard, was that this was all by choice. You mm -hmm. know, many times in the past, I would mm -hmm. go through struggles where it felt like it was the circumstance that it was out of my control that happened to me. 
Mm. Right. And then I have to trust God through that circumstance because it's just beyond my control. I, yeah. I can't do anything about it. And that's great to see his faithfulness in things that you can't control. Yeah. Sure. Joining, leaving Amazon and joining Theotech was my choice. Yeah. It was under my control. Like I chose to do this because I believed God's promise that this is what he wanted me to do. It didn't happen to me. Well, you, you also kind of wanted to do this too, right? I, I had the desire to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I felt like I was called to do it, you know? Mm. So, but I, I made the choice and I accept responsibility for the consequences of my choice. Yeah. Um, but that's been a whole new layer, basically, to trusting in God's sovereignty. Because, yeah. you know, it, there's, a di- there's a big difference, right, between like, oh, I got sick, I didn't have any control over it, and now I have to trust God that he's going to take care of my life. Yeah. Versus, oh, I have this money, I have this job, I can do all these things with it, and I'm intentionally choosing to give them up and to invest or speculate that pursuing this venture mm-hmm. is going to be worthwhile for the kingdom and yeah. for God. Yeah, for sure. That's a, different, that's a different kind of trusting God. Yeah, for uh, sure. So, I mean, you talked about character development. Yeah. And I was just wondering, is that something that is just constantly refi- refined day in, day out? Or is there, like, particular examples that you can give us uh, kind of in this within this two-year time span where you felt like, um, you know, these are the lessons I've learned? Um, you know, anything specific comes to mind? I think that I have journals and journals and journals of random insights and okay. things like that along the way. Maybe one day I'll compile them and share them. <laughs> Okay. Uh, hey, you can write a book. Oh yeah, you can write Theotech a book. book. Yeah, stay tuned, guys. No. <laughs> <laughs> any, any anybody out there that's a publisher or a publishing company or have connections, please let us know. Yeah, well, we'd be happy to share this in a book <laughs> format. Um, so the, I think that what makes it tricky to say it's not so much lessons learned; there are insights mm-hmm. for sure. But you know, in the biggest, if I were to take the ten thousand foot view, in what I've gone through and stuff, it just has felt like wow, I have so much more room to grow in trusting God. Mm. It's so simple. It can be cliche. We can, we can overlook it. But this has tested my faith like nothing ever before. And it's just like, I just see how much I don't trust God or how, like, how quickly my faith erodes. Like, you know how the disciples in Jesus' day, like, where they would see an amazing miracle, like the feeding of the 5,000 mm-hmm. and then the feeding of the 4,000. And yeah. then they were out of bread on the ship on the boat and then they're like and they're oh. done <laughs> and then they're like, oh jesus is mad because we didn't bring enough bread it's like it's like guys what happened when we fed the five thousand to the four thousand like it's not about the bread yeah. what's your problem like you know you still don't believe you still don't believe you still don't believe it's like don't you believe yet and and like we kind of are too quick to judge too because it's like oh god you, you guys are so stupid you know like yeah like guys you just saw him raise the the dead yeah you still don't believe him um and i think that uh, i can relate to that I can relate to that a lot where I'll see God come through in some amazing way, um, providing some in some way or just having so much joy in what I'm doing and mm-hmm. uh, in serving other people and, and hearing the stories about how God is working in their lives through the things that I'm doing or what, even just what he's doing apart from me, really. Mm-hmm. And it's so easy for me then to forget in the middle of like, oh, God, you didn't give me this. You didn't give me that. And like, this hasn't worked mm-hmm. out. And like and feeling just like I, I don't, you know, my faith just erodes so quickly yeah. and it's scary and it's sad, but it's the truth. Um, and so if I were to summarize like one big lesson aside from all the details that we can go over some other time, Mm -hmm. um, it's not so much a lesson as much as it's an ongoing process to trust him with everything and not just in brief moments, but over long periods of time. Yeah. Like, you know, I think that, oh, here's an example. Well, not an example, but you know, in the past I've had to trust God for things like this to say when I was a kid doing well on a test, I'll pray, I'll study, I'll pray. But then you find out after you take the test what he did and how it went. Yeah. It's a kind of a quick turnaround time. Mm-hmm. Quick feedback loop. Yeah, for sure. You compare that with Theotech, which is like, I don't know how long it's going to take. Yeah. I, I believe God made some promises that he's going to provide for me. Mm-hmm. How is he going to do it? I don't know. Am I provided for every day? Yes. You know, out of other means. But is he going to bless this? Is he going to provide for it? Yeah. It's a long-term... And like, t- what's the measure of success, right? Because like on a test, it's like points right sure but yep. then like in field tech what's the measure of success that's right, right? so and, and then the thing is that god is like a triple threat or whatever in the sense that you know he has so many different ways that he can bring about whatever he wants to bring about yeah and success can be measured in all kinds of ways over different time frames like it could like look like losing in the course of this year or these months or several years but in the big picture it looks like it's actually, it's actually winning it's a, mm-hmm. strate- a strategic victory yeah so that's what makes it tough and then i just look at abraham who was promised a son in his old age and he waited several years before that promise was actually fulfilled and then there were other promises made about descendants as many as the stars in the sky. Mm-hmm. And he was dead before he could ever see that promise fulfilled. Yeah. 
So, so he couldn't even see the return on investment. <laughs> he didn't even see the promise, promise fulfilled. Yeah. And that's exactly what Hebrews 11 says. And so I'm just seeing like, wow, like God does answer prayer. He does fulfill promises in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term, and in the li- like, you know, beyond your lifespan beyond term. term. yeah. And it, how can you trust God for something that's beyond your lifespan? Yeah. David did. He believed God was going to give him a descendant on the throne forever. That means that after David's dead, there's still going to be his lineage. Yeah. It's just incredible. And he believed God for that. Um, and, he, and God fulfilled that through Jesus. Right, right. So I'm just seeing how small and weak my faith really is. Uh, and, that, and the lesson is to trust the Lord, that his word will not fail, that his promise is sure, that he himself will see to it with all his omnipotent power, yeah. that, he, that his word is kept. <sighs> yeah. I, I mean, I have another question, but like um, as you're s- speaking all this, and like I, I just have to say like, this whole character development, right? Like it's important, but at the same time, like, can you really put a price tag on it? You know, I I don't think so. Right. So I think like what you're doing, even though it's tough, it's priceless too. So, um, Oh, it is priceless. Yeah. Yeah. And I've grown so much more than I can imagine basically through this whole experience. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's an education worth paying for. I mean, yeah. Talk about like, immediate or like medium return on investment like this is already something that we're seeing in you at least for me like as a bystander yeah it's much more as someone who's experiencing this right now but like you're already seeing that return on investment in ways That's that money can't in ways buy. that money can't buy yeah. outcomes that money can't buy yeah. i love that and i mean you wrote about that too so <laughs> um but uh, i do want to get back to another question that i had which was um i think a lot of people uh, viewed your kind of resolve to start Theotech as very noble and very brave and just kind of like uh, how, you know, like Lord of the Rings started out. Like, mm. you know, you got, you got this bright-eyed hobbit and he's just like walking out the door and just like, I'm going on adventure. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, everything was like kind of bright and shiny as he leaves the Shire, right? And um, I'm thinking, was that your experience? Or did you find out that once you walked out the door that it was a ice cold world and you fell flat on your face <laughs> in the first couple of weeks? Uh, you basically put words in my mouth. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, it totally was like the latter. And I would say first also about the whole noble thing. Yeah. Uh, I think the reality is that people thought I was a gutsy risk taker, but for me, it wasn't really about taking risk or not taking risk. Yeah. It was just like, if God called me to do it, I got to go. Yeah. Because I consider myself normally risk averse. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like yeah. Self-preservation, right? Yeah, totally. Uh, but, th- and so I, I would say this, like whether you feel like you're a brave person or you're not a brave person, mm-hmm. uh, walking with the Lord makes you look brave. Mm, interesting. <laughs> yeah. When you obey him at all costs or whatever like that, you look crazy and you look brave yeah. and maybe noble, but it's that's the outward perception. Inwardly, you can just be as scared as ever, but you're just saying, God, I'm going to still obey you. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what happened immediately, like, uh, the wider context of my life was that there were trials going on in other settings. My church was going through some terrible t- trials at that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I felt like I was being really stupid, but I, uh, because at the same time that I was trying to start Theotech, um, it seemed like God was calling me to step in as a leader at the church in the midst of those conflicts and trials. Mm. And I knew it was going to be exhausting. It's going to take a lot of time and everything like that. And I didn't, I really didn't want to do it. But when I prayed about it, I, I just kind of envisioned Jesus um, as the good shepherd laying down his life for his sheep. Mm. And I felt, I felt like, well, if I'm his follower, then I'll do what he does. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's what made me willing to step into that role to help. And it was indeed quite a trial. Mm-hmm. And so that immediately took up a lot of my attention. So I wasn't really doing any stuff for Theotech, for Ceaseless or Spiffio or anything. Those first few months or whatever like that, it was just like, ah. Um, and then shortly after uh, that happened, and as I was going through that, I actually, in January of the year after I left, which was like three months later, mm-hmm. I got an ear infection. Oh. And it was so bad that I was bedridden for like a month and I got nothing done. <laughs> it, was t- it was terrible. Uh, in fact, I, I, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, God, like, you know, they all, people always say that, oh, when you start doing God's will, it's not like it's going to be easy. In fact, you're going to come under spiritual attack and all these other things like that. Mm-hmm. And you hear that. And I think it's true. Uh, and it's just like, it was almost like ironic that it was predictable in some ways that this is exactly what's happening. Like yeah. I step out of faith and I'm bettered in for a month. Great. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, I got health insurance like the month before. Oh, uh, yeah. Dang. This is the whole thing. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. 
So, um, so God still provided. God still provided. But it still sucked. It still sucked. And yeah. it, felt, it just felt like, what am I doing? Like, you know, this is, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, but there were, you know, at the same time, I would say this, everything is so mixed together yeah. because in that September, uh, not September, but October after I left and stuff, I got connected to somebody from the leadership network, uh, my friend Chris Armas, who was uh, leading an initiative to do hackathons around America uh, called Code for the Kingdom, mm-hmm. which is designed to convene, you know, bright technologists and entrepreneurs to use their gifts for the gospel. Mm-hmm. So I got connected to this thing, uh, to him and to this, uh, this you know, initiative. And it was like, this is a perfect lineup with what I believe God called me to do. Mm-hmm. So I volunteered to become a co-organizer for the Seattle Code for the Kingdom Hackathon. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that was just like, for me, it was like a totally a God thing, right? Because like, yeah. in order to, to spread that mindset of technology, entrepreneurship for the gospel, I would need to do things like this, right? This yeah. is beyond my company. This is to activate and serve the community at large and to get be- more and more believers to be doing things this way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then God just kind of put it in my lap <laughs> through <laughs> this relationship that was serendipitous. And, uh, and so that's been an amazing kind of thread to my whole story, which, uh, which emerged right there soon after I, I left yeah. and I didn't plan it. He just kind of dropped my lap. And so we're still doing code for the kingdoms. This is a little uh, plug, I guess, in October 2nd to 4th, there will be code for the kingdom Seattle, God willing. And there's actually, it's a global hackathon. So it's going to happen simultaneously in 15 cities. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was just like in Seattle. It's so not just Seattle. My plug was like, if you're in Seattle, definitely come to the Seattle code for the kingdom. But yeah. I didn't code act- for the kingdom.org. I didn't know it was going on. Yeah, it's happening in LA. It's happening in uh, Atlanta. It's happening in Austin is or it, Dallas. It's happening in Jakarta. Jakarta, yeah. Yeah, it's happening in. Is it Hong Kong? Is it? There might be one in Hong Kong, Bangalore. I don't oh, Bangalore, know. Yeah, yeah. Bangalore, yeah. So it's going to be it's going to be exciting. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and uh, that's something that God just provided right there. Yeah. And I continue to serve in that movement because it fits with my mission, even though it doesn't directly benefit Theotech. It kind of does, though. You get to meet people. People get to meet Absolutely, you. Absolutely, it you benefits. Yeah, it benefits in the sense of relationships and connections, but. Yeah. It's not like building the business or selling a product, I guess. Yeah, but yeah. I love it because it's serving the purpose, the mission. Yeah. And yeah. just a side thing, you did win uh, that one time, right? Yes, I got to. So I helped organize the Seattle Code for the Kingdom. Yeah. And then under my dad's strong advisement, he came with me, we went to compete in the Bay Area Hackathon, mm-hmm. Code for the Kingdom. And then that's where I presented Ceaseless, the, the movement and app that helps people pray for their, for their friends and pray for others on a regular basis. And uh, that actually won several, two prizes there. Nice. Uh, so yeah, thank God for that. That was a huge encouragement. And that's an example of where like, you know, in that moment, it's like, oh, this is so awesome. Thank you, God. And you're like, yeah. yes, God, you're with me. Yeah. And then soon after it just feels like oh, nothing's happening and I'm just a loser. And what am I doing? And like, yeah. uh, so yeah. that's an example of how like faith can like be so bright for a moment and then like so easily you have to fight for it. Yeah, for you sure. You have to fight for it. And I mean, I brought up the question earlier because uh, I just like wanted to encourage listeners out there like if you're if you have an idea you really want to start something um it may not be very glamorous in the beginning and it certainly wasn't for chris and i think like that's the misconception I, at least for me i know that's the misconception that i have for myself too like whenever i'm trying to start a project i think it's going to be like super fun super cool this is my passion this mm. is like what i want to do like i know that i was born for this role and then you <laughs> go for it and you're waiting in the mud for like you know four or five months just trying to get through all oh, the, man. You know, totally. the, all the crap, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and, and that's why it's called, actually the word passion is I think to suffer. And ah. so I, okay, I'm going to make a distinction here. Okay. For myself, I realized one thing, my pleasure, I actually love to preach. I realize that to preach the gospel. I don't like, I don't want to be a pastor or anything like that, but I love to share the gospel and see people like, like, <gasps> God's amazing. Yeah. Like that's an amazing experience for me. That's my pleasure. Like I do it because I want to for fun. Uh-huh. But theotech and technology entrepreneurship for the gospel, although I love it, it's more of a passion in that I'm going to suffer mm. to make it happen. Yeah. I'm going to go through the pain to see what it takes to give birth to this thing. Mm. Uh, and that's my distinction in my head between pleasure and passion. Mm. I see. Actually, um, that's a good that's a good insight because I haven't thought about that. And now that you've brought it, uh, I'm gonna have to think about how music fits into my life. <laughs> but that's that's not uh, that's for another time. But um, yeah, so even now, I mean, you've gotten you know traction. Um, Theotech's been out for two years. You've had some ups. You know, like great things have come through Theotech and just through the affiliates. And you've been able to like meet um, a lot of cool people. But there's still like you know ups and downs, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, you know, like talk like we're getting into, you know, nowadays, right? You mm-hmm. know? Um, yeah. Can you like kind of share that experience? Like currently, 
how are things you know is everything like smooth sailing you got these little bumps in the way or like how, um how so is life so far let me <laughs> or, I, okay let me set some context and then address some things okay so some context is that i feel like because technology entrepreneurship for the gospel is a new concept it's an, it's an emerging thing yeah it's not the way that we've done things before right uh, it's kind of it's still difficult because people don't really get the concept the first time around the second time around and that's why we have to keep pushing forward and and doing things like ceaseless and spiffio and stuff so that people start getting a sense of like oh this is what it is mm. this is what it is this is what it's like this is what it's about um, and, you know because I know there's some there's definitely social entrepreneurship mm-hmm. people doing entrepreneurship where they have some sort of triple bottom line some sort of you know uh, positive social impact that they're trying to do um, there's been businesses mission which is more of like we can use businesses to build to be able to get Christians into places where they can't normally go, mm. uh, where they do real business work, but that gives them an opportunity to build relationships to share the gospel with the unreached. Mm-hmm. Right? There's been businesses, businesses mission. There's been kind of the faith and work movement where like, okay, I'm at my workplace most of the time, not, ch- not church on Sunday, so how do I integrate my faith and my work? Mm. Not, so how do I do it in the sense of like evangelizing or you know, building relationships and how, is, how about the goodness of my work itself and serving others, you know, those kinds of concepts. Or I can, I can do my business in an ethical way uh, that's going to be reflective of what God values, right? Those kinds of things. But there hasn't quite been technology entrepreneurship for the gospel where you're basically saying, we're going to make our business goals God goals, basically. Mm-hmm. The things that he wants to see, we're going to put a goal around that and we're going to try to line up and organize everything that we do to deliver on, the, on that outcome that he wants and that experience that will delight him basically Mm -hmm. which means that you're inventing stuff like a product that's not just trying to be a successful product you're trying to measure your success by what he wants Mm -hmm. so that's been something that i haven't seen very much of yet and it's still kind of emerging and that makes it kind of tricky because who are you going to go to to raise money and how are you going to recruit people right right? and who are you going to sell to who is your customer is god your customer in the in that sense too or like who's going to actually pay you in exchange for your service or product? Mm-hmm. So there's all these like open there's all these kind of open good questions, but open ones that have to kind of be figured out. Right. That makes it a continually tricky thing. It's not just like, "Oh, I know I'm going to start a restaurant. I'll get a loan, hire the chef, the staff, you know, if the food's good, it smells good, we're going to market it, people will come." And you know, it's like a well-known repeatable business model. Right. This is something new. It's weird. It's unknown. Mm-hmm. Um so that's that's one side uh of that and that makes it challenging. Um, and then the, so that's part of that context. And then there's like the personal context mm-hmm. where I have, I'm just a human being like anybody else. Mm-hmm. I have my emotional ups and downs. I have my unfulfilled desires. I have, you know, just being tired after working until 3am or the night or whatever like that. And like, you know, just being another regular old human being. Mm-hmm. And those are, um, that's where it's like kind of learning and growing in discipline and having emotional fortitude to be able to handle all the ups and downs that are going to come with this. Like, it's basically, I'm getting better, but I'm still not that good at it, Yeah. right, uh, on the day-to-day. So, one thing I'm really thankful for in recent days is that my sister has joined me as a co-founder ah. for Theotech. So, so Theotech uh, actually doubled, yes, guys. Yes, we doubled. This is phenomenal. Yeah. Before, it was just interns. Now, I have a full-time person who's working with me. It's my sister. <laughs> uh, thanks, Tosh. Uh, and, uh, and she's been already, like, we started, we kicked it off with a, a one-on-one where we went over some goals and set expectations and stuff. And then I had her do a strengths finder, which is a tool to help you discover your strengths. And the idea is that of strengths-based leadership is that you should have people play to their strengths and yeah. then form a team where people can complement each other. Cause yeah. then everybody's doing what they're best at mm-hmm. rather than trying to shore up your own weaknesses cause you're not good enough, which can be a waste of time. Right. Put a team together where everybody has different strengths and they can succeed. Mm-hmm. That's the idea of strengths finder. Okay. So um, we did that, and I was really happily surprised that my sister has completely different strengths than me. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good only in the context of what you just said, where your strength, you're trying to complement strength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As that's, a team, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, and so she's been diving more into the analytics, social media, and those kinds of things like that, which I set up, but I never really dove deep into, because mm. I'm more of a product development guy. Yeah. Uh, and that's already been a real real help and joy in these recent days so again like that's another huge blessing Mm -hmm. and it's like something that we're all like really rejoicing that i mean it's definitely nice to have a helping hand i mean yeah and like you know for me what i love is that i wasn't trying to recruit her actually yeah yeah she chose to do it because she believes in the mission and yes she wants to help me but she believes in herself and she also wants to grow she sees this as she's seen the growth i guess in my life and she's like 
yeah, I, I should do this. Like, this is a growth opportunity for me too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she believes in the mission of helping people to do what they love for the sake of the gospel mm-hmm. um, and like activating them really for that purpose. Like, that's what she keeps, every time I talk with her about it, like, that's what I hear repeatedly. Because mm-hmm. I think when she was younger, she actually wanted to start a school where people could discover what they love to do, what they're good at mm-hmm. and do more of that. Oh, so, interesting. Uh, so this kind of is interesting because it's, it's kind of what the ed tech is trying yeah, to Yeah, it's kind of aligning. Well, exactly. That's so. really cool. Yeah. Praise God for that. Um, and it, I think it's really cool. I mean, obviously, you guys are brothers and sisters. So, I mean, there is more weight and pull between you guys. But, like, it's really cool to see you, like, inspire people to the point where they're willing to give up their jobs. And, I mean, willing to give up, um, you know, a career path and, and, and kind of follow you in this in this way. So well, each person according to what God calls. Yeah, and it, I mean it's really powerful because for me, like one of, one of the things that I really passionate about is people working with, not working for. Mm. Uh, obviously, again, like there's different companies that have different hiring hierarchies and whatever. Um, but it's really powerful when um, you know I believe in a purpose, I believe in the mission, and I'm actually working with you know the other person. So mm-hmm. um, like this whole podcast thing, like I. I'm ecstatic to do it. Like I, I love like setting all this stuff up. You, you guys can't see behind the scenes. Well, you guys can't see anything. <laughs> we could take Instagram pictures. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I do need to take it. Uh, social media. Um, follow us on social media, you guys. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's definitely really a blessing to just be able to set everything up. And yeah, Alan loves audio equipment, setting it up, taking it yeah. down, doing the production. Like this is one of his pleasures, I think. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm so happy that he can do this. Yeah. I'm happy that I'm, I'm like, I'm smiling, yeah. but you guys can't see that. <laughs> I think they can hear it in your voice. Oh, uh, you can, you can hear my smile. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, again, like we've been talking a lot about, you know, these outcomes where you really can't put a dollar value on, you know, just like, uh, for example, that, you know, the camaraderie between you and Tosh, um, uh, you know, relationships that you've been building, even like, you know, your character development. Um, so um, are there any other like investment or investment outcomes that you really can't put a price tag on, but you feel like this is something that I've learned or this is something that I've gained? Uh, I think that you mean like on a personal level? Uh, personal or company wise? Because like I would say that definitely the relationships that I gained through this adventure are priceless. Like how would I meet them? Like yeah. I wouldn't have. And if they are ongoing, that's amazing. Um, mm-hmm. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, can you maybe like list a few people? Well, that like my, one of my mentors is Chris Armas, the guy I mentioned from Leadership Network, mm-hmm. um, who's the director for these initiatives, these Code for the Kingdom hackathon initiatives. You know, that's, it's been just great learning from him and um, having his input into my life and also serving alongside him for Code for the Kingdom and, you know, seeing the, seeing the fruit of people just joyful. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember last year's Code for the Kingdom, like the feedback that we got and stuff. I was like, people's like, this is like, you know, I can't wait till we can do it again. Like, this was so amazing. Like, I grew in my confidence as a developer, and I was so happy I could do it for the gospel. I mm-hmm. could do it for God. Like, this is so cool. Um, and, you know, we're, you can't really buy that. You can't buy that kind of praise or that kind of joy, you know, in people's lives. And the fact that they enjoyed it was amazing. And I think that one of the things that made it special was that so many people are giving at these events. Mm-hmm. It's a really amazing culture that I haven't really found anywhere else yet where you have leaders who are giving who are serving right freely and then it creates this culture and set this sets this tone where when everyone's giving and like collaborating and things like that it's just like it's just beautiful yeah. and i think it's a foretaste of god's kingdom and that's really how god intended for his people to be when they're together mm. but it's rare and let's make it less rare let's make it common let's make it like something that happens regularly and often yeah. um, but that's priceless you can't pay for people to get along to that degree right yeah for sure people can always be friendly and and courteous courteous yeah but you're not gonna have people like suffering intensely side by side till like 5 a.m in the morning building this project thing together and learning together in order to deliver yeah. uh you know a, an invention that's gonna help um advance the gospel yeah. like that's a rare kind of experience especially with people that are strangers that you just met yeah for sure yeah um this is kind of off topic but uh would you consider yourself to be more of an extrovert introvert uh, i'm an introvert but i think i'm in the middle Okay, so like kind of balanced. Yeah. So, um, so y- you enjoy like you know meeting people and getting to know these uh, you know these people and interacting with them. Like- yeah, I think I do. Um, I get my energy from being alone rather than from being with others. I think, but I do enjoy meeting people. And you want to know why? Okay. Why? I think I recently discovered this. I'm actually a very selfish extrovert or a selfish oh. introvert because I have a thirst for knowledge. I'm curious. 
Uh, and so I love meeting new people so that I can satisfy my curiosity. And mm. so it's cool because it's for them, it sounds like I'm really interested in them. And I am. The truth is that I am. But you're interested. Well, you're interested in like analyzing them. <laughs> Not just analyzing them, but like I want to get, I want to suck their knowledge out of their brain and into mine. Like I want to uh, soak it all up. Okay. Uh, and not to take the, that's the beautiful thing about knowledge, right? It's like, it's not a zero sum game. If yeah. I gain it, they didn't lose anything That's true. and I can give mine and they don't, and I don't lose anything either. So right. it's beautiful. I think it's a good thing. I was just saying that it seems kind of selfish. Cause like, I realize now like, Oh, when I meet this person, like, I'm just like so curious. I want to learn everything I can from them. <laughs> and just like, that's why like, you know, yeah. So that's why I love meeting with people. Uh, I just want to, I just want to absorb just their knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Everything that I can. That's a good attitude. I mean, especially if you're like starting out and you're talking to someone that's been in the business or been, in, you know, an expert in their field, like that's something yeah, they can really yeah. benefit from. And the thing is that it's not always that they have to directly teach me. Yeah. I sometimes I just have to kind of listen to them, listen, listen, listen. It's and begin inference, to get, like passive mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. inference. And that's what makes it fun. I think it's also, I'm constructing knowledge and connecting it to my existing knowledge base. Yeah. But translating what they're kind of, what they're emitting, what they're saying explicitly and all those things like that. And just like kind of learning. And that's what makes it so fun to meet people for me. In addition to helping them, serving them, seeing them unleashed, right. For the kingdom, encouraging them. Those can be really precious moments where, uh, you know, somebody's down and, and you speak just exactly the word that they need to hear. You're just listening and they're lifted up. Yeah. And you're just like, you know, this is good. Yeah, for sure. And I think about, uh, thing about communication is that, um, if they're passionate about that particular subject or particular topic, like they'll just go on and on. And then, um, as someone like, cause, cause I do the same thing too. Like mm-hmm. I, I like digging up stuff from people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't have to dig too hard when someone's really passionate about something. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I have a, a bunch of friends who are like really passionate about games and gaming. And whenever the topic of games come up, I don't have to like say much. I just ask a few questions and they'll just go on and on. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, I think part of that communication is finding out like what they're passionate about mm-hmm. and then going for that. Yep. If you can discover that you can yeah. unlock them. Yeah. And I think in your, in your context or in your case, like uh, a lot of times you're trying to dig up um, certain values that you uh, kind of value as well. And you're trying to bring that to the forefront and, and kind of seeing like who is a good fit for you to not only mentor you, but also maybe walk alongside you as well. Do you do that or? I don't know how intentional I've been actually with my mentors is that I discovered in retrospect that those are the kinds of people I wanted to be accountable to. Mm. So I had conversations with them and I tend to be a pretty open guy, open book. Mm -hmm. And then I realized after the fact, it's like, as I thought back on it during a time of my just struggling and stuff, I was like, hmm, these are the kinds of people that I would want to have as my mentors. Mm. And so then I asked them. I wasn't, I didn't go into the relationships looking for mentors. It was more like a, huh, based on the kind of advice and counsel they gave me, the prayers that we prayed together. Yeah. And their listening ear and their empathy for me, like, I think these are the kinds of people I'd want as my mentors. So then I asked them after the fact. Okay. Not beforehand. I didn't, I didn't set out intending to find them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They just happened. Yeah. It was more like they happened. And then afterwards I could go back and say like, these are the people that I think that uh, I would like as my mentors. I see. I see. Yeah. Cause like with mentors, like I feel like one of the things that you want is, uh, you want to find people that you want to be accountable to. Yeah. yeah you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, and so you can't always figure that out from the outset. It's kind of in retrospect, you're like, oh. You gotta find it. Yeah, that's the kind of person that I, as you weigh them, you're like, that's the kind yeah. of person. Because there's plenty of people who want to mentor, plenty of people who want mentees, or yeah. want to mentor, or who want to be mentored. But many times those relationships may not work. Even though they have more skill or knowledge than you, yeah. it just may not, it may not really work, you know. Yeah. There has to be a, a level of connection, mutual respect, and, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's something that I learned uh, as a youth counselor is that both mentors and mentees, they have to make the decision. And uh, so one of the questions I have for you, Chris, is like, um, did most of your most of the people that you asked to mentor you, did they eventually say yes? Or like some of them like, oh, yeah, they all said it? yes. Oh, nice. And okay. that's probably because, like I said, it was it was an after the fact thing. Yeah. It was to kind of look back on the relationships and say, like, wow, these guys were really there for me. They care about me as a person. Mm-hmm. They're not just there for me as a business or whatever like that. Yeah. Uh, and the kind of counsel that they gave me, the advice they gave me was so God-centered. Yeah. So it's it's exactly like, they're not giving me just like this bad, just like this advice that seems like common sense or whatever. They're trying to point me to Christ and they can empathize with the struggles that I go through. So they're not just like kind of not listening to me, just telling me what to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then that empathy, they're also able to share from their experience. So it's like, yeah, so it's that whole picture where it's like, mm, this is mm-hmm. the kind of person that I'm, I would love to have as a mentor and because they would already had those conversations from before, yeah. then when I asked them, it's not that hard because they also 
I think to some degree felt the same way. It's like, yeah. this is the kind of person I want to mentor. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that relationship has to be reciprocal. Um, of course. Not only do you find them to be appealing mentors, but they also have to kind of accept that role and responsibility as being a mentor yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if, if, if we're talking about mentorship because people are interested in that, like, I think that, uh, I think that it's really good just to be in relationships with people where you're, where you're fairly transparent and open mm -hmm. and then you can, and then you can kind of weigh it in retrospect. You can kind of weigh and say like, Hmm, how did this person respond to what I shared with them? And yeah. what kind of advice did they give me? Yeah. And is that kind of the kind of counsel that I think is right? And I want more of, yeah, for because sure. oftentimes as a mentee, you're still responsible for yourself. Your mentors can't fix you. Yeah. They're there for you, but they can't fix you. They can guide you. They can guide you. They can counsel you, but you're still it's you're still yourself. You have to make your own decisions and yeah. be responsible. So it's really helpful. What I found is that I'm looking for the mentors who can help me remember and believe and do the things that I already think are right. Mm, okay. When you feel like you when I feel like I can't, can't and yeah. I don't want to and I don't believe it anymore. Yeah. So that's why like it's great to be accountable to people who are like that. Mm. And of course, there's other benefits to mentors, but you're not trying to use them then, like in a sense. Yeah, for sure. Because you're, then, then you're, you're, what you're doing is you're inviting them into your life, asking them to do what they already want to do. Mm -hmm. That's like the whole thing that you said about not, not working for, but working with. Yeah, you're asking sure. your mentors to work with you, not for you. Yeah. Right? Or you're not working for them. Either. And you're not working for them. You're working with them. Yeah. So. Yeah. And um, I guess, so how long have you had these mentors? Uh, it's probably coming on like, what nine months now okay yeah. and throughout that time do you think like that's definitely helped you uh in building theotech and just building you as a person it's helped me build me as a person okay theotech to a secondary degree but not as much yet yeah they can um but it's been definitely more of the personal side at mm. this i think at this point yeah. and uh that's always the bedrock the foundation right yeah. the entrepreneurs yeah. the companies comes after the entrepreneur that's true <laughs> yeah it's the person that builds the company yes. right? yeah uh so and uh, yeah, there have been some significant trials through which they continue to be a very helpful voice mm. um, that I've been through. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this is part of God's blessing uh, in terms of character development in your life. Right. So, I mean, we to kind of go back and make a full circle loop, like character development was one of those big things that I think doesn't have any intrinsic value, but that's something that you feel like you've grown a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, your mentors are able to kind of help facilitate that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to tie it back to what you mentioned about investment and things like that, these are kind of, you know, these are priceless. The relationships are priceless, right? Yeah. Um, but they weren't really something that you set out to do as an investment either. Mm -hmm. They kind of happened. Yeah. And you continued to invest in them because you wanted to, not because you saw that, oh, there's a great return on this relationship, so I'm going to keep doing this one. Yeah. No, it's because, it's because, um, it, you guys your missions lined up and you guys care about each other and you know the relationship continues although we might view it as an investment i kind of view it as like it's a gift mm -hmm. uh, that's how i would view it as a gift you know it, it's really good i mean it's really encouraging too because um i i saw you um strike out on theotech alone like you know when you, when you decide to leave amazon and i actually do remember there was um i think like a meeting or something that you or something that your family hosted and then uh, you actually wrote uh, and gave like a little speech about like why you're leaving uh, Amazon. Mm. I remember that. Do you remember that dinner? I, I remember. I remember the dinner. I didn't remember that I wrote a speech. Uh, it was kind of well, okay, maybe not a speech, but you you did you know end up like talking you know, about yeah, it. Yeah, talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, whether that was something that you're like really uh, interested in, or whether your parents wanted you to do that, I don't know. But uh, like you're able to, yeah, you gave a little talk on why you were leaving Amazon, mm -hmm. and I remember that. Um, and yeah, here you are now, two ish years later, mm -hmm. you know, slowly growing and you've got people now to walk alongside you. Mm -hmm. Some, some of them in front of you, some behind you, I guess. Yeah. I don't know how we got into mentorship and relationships, but it's cause you wanted to talk about it. I, yeah, See? I did. Want just to let talk it flow. About it. Yeah. So we could talk about investments, but I think that, um, your relationships are so core basically, yeah. right? When, when the relationships aren't working out so well in your life, everything else kind of just is hard and sucks. Yeah. When you have thriving relationships, everything else is, feels like anything is possible. Yeah, for sure. It's huge. Do you want to challenge yourself and try to tie this all back to venture Calvinist? <laughs> of course. I mean, um, you know, you set out to ask about what are the outcomes that money can't buy. Yeah. And uh, when I talked about that initially, I wasn't really talking about these priceless outcomes, which are definitely a gift that I'm grateful for. But they're more of like 
something that seems so impossible that there's nowhere that you could go to buy it, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, if, with Ceaseless, the prayer app, where could you buy 55 million people praying for one another sincerely and seeing God do the impossible in response to what they're asking for? Mm-hmm. You can't. And if God's the customer, like, is there a kind of a company that he could fund that would do that? Mm-hmm. Not really. Like, there's no place where he would do that right now. You wouldn't ask Google to do that. He's control over, you know, Google or Amazon, Microsoft, whatever like that, in the sense of his sovereignty. Mm-hmm. But um, how amazing would it be to be able to put, for me, to invest my time, attention, wealth, life, and things like that for an outcome that money cannot buy? Mm-hmm. Like, if I give my two, uh, what is it, five loaves and two fish, right? Mm-hmm. Like that little boy in the, in the story where Jesus fed the 5,000, mm-hmm. and God multiplies it so that because of this small app called Ceaseless, uh, he ended up activating 55 million believers to pray for one another and ended up praying for everybody on earth personally. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I would feel like, you know, I would feel like richer than a billionaire or whatever like that. Cause even if I was a billionaire, I couldn't buy that outcome. Yeah. Um, and yet God could take whatever small things I had to offer and multiply it to do the impossible, to do the things that he wanted. And the only reason why I get the benefit of it is because it's all him. And I just happened to put my, you know, it's like riding on somebody else's coattails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, oh, you just put your money in at the right place at the right time and God did something incredible with it. It only feels like you cheated a little bit. Yeah, it's all, yeah I'm just, <laughs> I just cheated. Just, yeah, got lucky. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and other things like that too, like um, outcomes money can't buy. Like, you know, you can buy labor. Money is power to control labor. Yeah. When you have a lot of it, you can direct people's labor to what, you know, what do you want them to do? You can control them. Money is power in that sense. Yeah. But you can't really buy the outcome of people doing what they love. Yeah, and you can't really buy the outcome of people doing what they love for the sake of the gospel. Like, where would you get that? But if because we have the labor and the investment that we put into something like Theotech, more and more believers get the mindset of starting with God as our customer. More and more believers and unbelievers too, frankly, if they want in on God's kingdom, because yeah. uh, they see the joy of it of being able to do what they love for something that really matters, mm-hmm. um, and they get activated so that they end up using their gifts for the gospel. Mm-hmm. Where can you buy that outcome? You can't. Like it's incredible. Uh, yeah. and so that's what I, that's kind of what I mean in one sense of talking about outcomes money can't buy is that the things that God wants as a customer are actually things that nobody could really afford or buy. Yeah. Like there's no way you can convert it from cash into outcome. Yeah. Um, it's more than that. And so I want Theotech as a company to be a place where if you were an investor, you could feel almost as if you were able to buy the outcomes money can't buy. Yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah. Um, so it goes above and beyond the balance sheet. It goes above and beyond profit and loss. Uh, it's basically saying this is where you can get kingdom outcomes mm-hmm. in this company with this people. If you invest here, you can get kingdom outcomes because that's what they're doing. They're investing what they have in God's kingdom outcomes. That's powerful. That's, I mean, I'm just I'm just sitting here smiling. That's all. Oh. Like, it's it's really powerful, and uh, I love what you're doing, Chris. Like I I really I really hope that this can like get launched and people can start like really internalizing this right Mm -hmm. to activate themselves um and to really do what they love and on top of that if they can do what they love for the sake of the gospel that's like kind of our bonus sweet spot well for me like that's the requirement i think many people actually already want to pursue their passions and i want to serve them by helping them do that Mm -hmm. but for me the thing that makes it really worthwhile and meaningful is when it's for the kingdom of god because that's what's going to last forever everything else is going to fade away but what's in god's kingdom will remain forever and so when they get to line up what they love to do with something that's truly significant, significant to the sense that it lasts forever mm-hmm. and it's good, yeah. that's, where, that's where you get eternal joy, quote unquote, yeah. in the kingdom of God. Yeah, so sure. the two are, to me, the, uh, uh, it's just, yeah, that's where joy is and it's indispensable to have both um, because you can't just have people doing a lot of things like, oh, it's for the gospel or it's for God, for, you know, it's for the, it's, so I'm suffering a lot in the sense that like, I'm not, I don't get, I'm not really... You know, I'm just doing this grind that I have to do mm-hmm. um, because it's going to be for God. Mm-hmm. No, it should be something where we're creative, we're inventing, we're innovating, we're doing what we were made to do, what yeah. we were lo- what we love to do for the sake of the purpose that we were made for. Yeah. And with that, we are going to wrap. But before we do, uh, again, we're just going to bring up Code for the Kingdom. Uh, it's going to be in October. Second to fourth. Second to fourth. Uh, and it's going to happen kind of all over the world. Uh, there's going to be a, a uh, Code for the Kingdom here in Seattle. So if you're in Seattle, mm-hmm. please check out codeforthekingdom.org. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And that's and, where they can see the other cities too. Yeah, and that's where you can see other cities. So if you're in other parts of the world uh, and there is a code for the kingdom near you, you can definitely go online register. It's early bird registration right now. Yep. And that's not going to last soon. So please hop on that website and uh, we'll hope to see you there. All right. Peace out. We're going to head out. See ya.